it is my honor to have the three uh, businesswomen with me, Sarah Chen, joining us from Washington, D.C., the uh, pleasure of having an online conference, and also Petra Thank Hauser, uh, country manager of Talent Garden Austria, and last but not least, Gabriele Tadeberger. And I would just hand over the word to Sarah to introduce herself and tell us a bit more about you and your background. Sure. Thanks so much, Astrid, and good afternoon to everyone in Vienna, in Europe, wherever you're joining from. It is the morning here and really glad to be starting off a great day with all of you. A little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from Malaysia, so I grew up in Malaysia, the Muslim majority country, and um, I actually studied law, read law in England, and then was able to join a corporate venture capital unit in Malaysia for a public listed company. And we were investing essentially into late stage biotech companies. And along the way, you know, uh, sort of going back into what I mentioned earlier, being a Muslim majority country, um, there were very unique experiences that I'm sure we can also share about later on. But part of it is, you know, that's a lot to be desired for the rights of women in Malaysia. And, you know, while I was climbing my corporate ladder in the corporate venture capital unit, I saw that there were a lot of great women around me, but they were not sort of sitting at the main table. I don't know if you have this in Austria, but we would have meetings where we would have the main decision making table and there would be spectator seats around the table. And these women would actually sit there. And whilst they were brilliant, I worked with them. I relied on them for, you know, their, their scientific and technical skills. Uh, they didn't necessarily want to step out and there were consequences, in fact, you know, I'm happy to speak a little bit more about this for being an ambitious woman. So that, you know, com com combined with my sort of 8 to 8 a.m. to 3 a.m. shift, I thought to myself, you know, there must be something I can do and there must be more purpose than working damn hard at my job. And that inspired me to start uh, Lean in Malaysia, which is a women empowerment platform in Malaysia, which is to educate, enable, and empower women into leadership. So working with women who took a career break and are looking to come back in, looking at women who are looking to negotiate uh, for higher salaries and, and get to the positions that they truly deserve. Um, and in a series of uh, serendipitous events, I uh, was sort of traveling to the U.S., investing into U.S. companies, met my husband along the way. So a little bit of a personal mm -hmm. twist there. Uh, but this is why I'm here now in Washington, D.C., and I am now the co-founder of the Billion Dollar Fund for Women, now also called Beyond the Billion, where we are a global consortium of venture capital investors and limited partner investors that invest into the VC funds that have committed to pledge, that have committed to invest uh, and have pledged to invest over a billion dollars into women-founded companies. And I'm really proud of uh, all the work that we've done. And it's interesting how sort of my two passions collided in the end, which is, as mentioned, women in leadership and venture capital. So this is what I'm doing right now. And uh, happy to share a little bit more, sit on a couple of boards as well. So uh, I guess this is why I'm here to talk about, you know, elevating yourself as an advisor and as a board member. Thanks, Astrid. Exactly. So much. Thank you for this uh, impressive introduction. Um, so, Petra, do you, would you like to continue with a short introduction? And yes, absolutely. Also... I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah, my name is Petra Hauser. I'm 53 years old and I made a very classical career in the media field. I uh, worked with Bertelsmann in different fields. Uh, I had functions in the radio um, space for Bertelsmann, and I was responsible for many, many radio stations all over Europe. And I had at that time a boss who really like um, was standing behind me and was helping me a lot. And this is how I already got into my first advisory board. And this was... Um, of a private radio station in Austria. <laughs> and this is also actually the reason why I came to Austria, because then um, after being part of the board, um, radio, private radio became active in Austria in 1998. This was later than Albania, by the way. Um, and then they searched for a CEO of that radio station and they couldn't find one. 
And la their last way out was actually making me the CEO of the radio station. I was 32 at that time. So this was my first experience. Then um, I stayed in Austria because I met my husband. Um, I'm mother of two children, 22 years old, the same age as the private radio has in Austria, by the way, and a 14 year old girl. Um, I then continued my uh, career uh, uh, with a big media agency and I was also working as managing director of a private television station. And after the media agency experience, um, um, I had a board by, uh, myself actually, so um, I was like supervised by, by a board. Um, consisting of many like very renowned managers uh, here in Austria from the telco sector, from big banks, and I had to report to them. So um, this is how I learned how advisory and especially supervisory boards are working. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I did that like for five years. I did the job for five years and then, then I really had enough Then I wanted to end my corporate career. And I um, told myself I would like to found something in the age of 50. And this was due to an experience that I had in the Silicon Valley at the Singularity University, which is a think tank led by two wonderful men, actually, Peter Diamandis and Ray Kurzweil, real future thinkers. And, and there I learned how um, our world will change exponentially. And I thought I have to change myself. Yeah, and this is why I then founded my company called Exponential Business Hub, so very much inspired um, by the Singularity University. And when I did that, I immersed myself into the field of innovation. And, and this was actually also the reason why I then became um, a member of two different other boards. Um, one is a real supervisory board of um, a big family business, uh, Silhouette Eyewear. I'm wearing one, um, but they are more uh, actually known for their rimless um, glasses. And even uh, the NASA astronauts are actually wearing them. And their biggest markets are the United States and, and Germany. So this is um, the one experience. And um, a smaller experience is I am part of the advisory board of Market Agent, which is the biggest online research company um, here in Austria. So these are very different experiences. And I'm very happy to share like um, how I got there and what the different experiences um, are sitting in, 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 in these boards. And um, not to um, forget to mention that I'm also a country manager of Talent Garden Austria, Europeans biggest co-working community and network um, for the tech uh, entrepreneurs all over Europe. This is a wonderful experience. When I um, got there, I told them, um, I have enough of bullshit. I will never again work for a corporate. Um, so I really have to love your culture. Otherwise, I will not join. Mm -hmm. And after visiting them in Milan, where the headquarter is, I learned that the culture of this company is so different and so wonderful. And I was really feeling at home like um, from, from the first day onwards. And I'm with them now um, since one year. And I'm very happy to be there. And this very much like um, contributes to my innovation experience. And as I said, I'm, I'm happy to share more about my board experiences. Um, yeah, which is why we are here today. <laughs> Thank you so much, Petra. And I can only confirm that the atmosphere at Talent Garden is amazing because that's the co-working space where the female factor is located and you're like a um, very important partner for us. So, um, Gabriele, please, the floor is yours. <laughs> oh, you have to unmute yourself. I'm also very honored to be part of this panel. Hello, uh, welcome also from my side. I'm Gabriele Tatsberger and my professional career started with um, being more in research and consultancy field where I started in an institute and I built up there the division for European networks and corporations. Later on, I entered in the board of directors, uh, and that was my first experience really with uh, also dealing with strategic thinking of how to build further the company. Um, after nearly 10 years there, I, I also had the feeling 
to that I need some change in further development and I switch to the Vienna Business Agency where currently I'm um, direct of startup services where we are really very keen to support international and Viennese startups and company founders through funds, real estate and also different services and we are very actively also inviting international startups to come here and to check out if Vienna could be a good place for you. And after dealing for a while with that, I had some, I, I, I got some additional functions. So one is that I'm also CEO of Vienna Region LTD, where we are doing international location marketing for Vienna Region and also doing some real estate developments within the region. And later on, since three years now, I'm also a board of the advisory for uh, one of the most successful university incubators, and it's the Viennese uh, University Incubator in it, which is focusing on high-tech uh, spin-offs of universities in Vienna. And uh, this, so to say, was the next step and uh, another new experience for me in order to deal with uh, strategic questions and uh, especially also in my function within the Vienna Business Agency, it's much more than just doing these grants and services and real estates. It's also to really strategically think, okay, what does the location need? How to connect with other locations internationally? We are very active in international startup city networks and try to really boost this topic and the different uh, topics that arises. So this is in a nutshell, um, the widespread functions mm -hmm. I have, I would say. And this uh, combined with my uh, loved husband and two kids I have, uh, it's quite uh, a challenge, but I love it. <laughs> oh, amazing. Thank you so much for this wonderful introduction. And before we really dive into the nitty gritties of how you made it to, into an advisory or supervisory board, I would also like I to get to like know the audience a little bit. Audience a little bit. So um, on Slider, um, there's, I'm going to just activate a poll. And the question is, um, um, uh, where are you joining us from? We just want to know where where you from, and yeah, I hope it works. Please, do you see the active poll, and then just type in your question, uh, your answer, where you're from. Sorry, <laughs> and I'm just leaving it on. Dina said she's from Del Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv, yeah. So, yeah, my sound, yeah, it's like because of uh, the others have to unmute it. Thank you for notifying, An Angela. It's um, just a general question. Have you already joined us on Slido to like submit questions and see the polls? Because so far, uh, but well, if, if that doesn't work, that's also fine. Um, then we're just um, just write in the question. Oh, there's no poll on Slido. Okay, obviously I did something wrong, <laughs> but never mind. Just write in the chat where you're from, and um, yeah. But you should actually be able to submit the questions, and then I would just. Um, start with our first question um, and we have here a question from Hannah and um, what are your biggest achievements in your career to date? So who want to go first? Happy to. I'm happy to because I think um, this is like a question I can answer very personally. Uh, when um, I had two functions as managing director in the media business, um, I uh, did my baby break. And this was a longer break because I had lost one child in between, so it was a longer break. Um, and then um, I just tried to go back. And I, I mean, I don't know how long it took until I really had 
this level of conversation again, namely regarding a position as a managing director or CEO and not like something else, because this is what I proved um, to have done successfully before two times. And um, after actually one and a half year of, I mean, an incredibly intense time also psychologically because I got so many no's yeah, being at home for such a long time and mm. being very ambitious um, about uh, my choice um, of the next um, job I would do. I then um, became managing director or CEO of the second biggest media agency group in Austria, which was almost impossible. Um, because there were big shareholders like the Austrian Post, um, um, a big bank, uh, the Telekom Austria and the Casinos Austria. And um, responsible for the supervisory board were uh, the board members of these big companies. And every like company had a political idea of who should be CEO of that media company. Um, and this was not me. Yeah, and I went through um, a decision process with Egon Sender, which is one of the most renowned like um, personal search companies here in Austria, um, very much focused on actually um, give somebody into a job who was already like um, decided before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this really um, happens, happens a lot here. And um, there was something decided before, but this was not me. Um, however, on the other hand, as I said, there were these like big companies and um, they were not really aligned on the topic, obviously, because everyone had their own kind of interests. So in the end, I managed to get that job. And then um, when I got that job, um, half of the branch did a bet how long I would stay there. And the longest bet was like three months because this was wow. so politically, um, the company was in a terrible situation. They had absolutely no digital marketing in place yeah, as the second biggest media agency. Uh, I mean, on, on, on the team side, um, there were big efforts to do so, like an incredible, incredible job. But I knew if I would not manage to do that job, I would be at home again. <laughs> <laughs> so I almost did not sleep for half a year. Yeah, I was like like a robot in a way. Yeah, I I went through all these like challenges, and in the end, we had a really thriving media agency. We won big clients. Um, it was really a, a wonderful team. Yeah, after two years, but this I would say is my biggest achievement. Also, with regard to how I how. I how I got that job. So not only doing it, but, but getting it actually. Maybe I can add on a little bit here. Um, my biggest achievement from a content side is that really the topic of startup and startup ecosystem grew with our efforts we started 10 years ago. And when I see what was there 10 years ago and what is here now, it's not our achievement alone, but I think that we did our contribution from a city point of view, that this is a topic and that there is a really great ecosystem now here in the city. And on the other hand, from a private point of view, uh, my biggest achievement was that I got the director's post and also the CEO post within my maternity leave. So I had uh, the opposite situation that I had a boss who believed so strongly in me besides having two children and a very small mm -hmm. one that he called me and asked me if I would like to take over. And um, But with all the hurdles and also with all the energy you need then because this was uh, quite a mess for one year for me personally. Uh, and uh, maybe because I think this is still much more a topic for women having a leadership uh, than for men uh, it's really you need to be very focused very organized and you need to look for your supporters in order to go through it uh, and I also had my point where I thought okay is it worth it because I love my work and I love my children but the balance was not really right for some time for me and then the thought that I just stay at home was so horrible for me that I <laughs> thought someday my kids will understand. And I tried to organize it a little bit in a different way. And I think now it works. And this is really, I really want to motivate uh, young women 
that it is manageable. You need to organize your environment in, in a way that it's, you can do it. Uh, but it should never be the reason to not do something. And if you have uh, the thinking that this is a job for you and you can do it, do it. And if you fail, learn out of it. But don't stop before because you have your doubts. Just try it. No, it there can, nothing serious can happen. And I always have a picture also in mind which um, um, convinces me in that way as well. Is If you look at a small child who is trying to learn to walk, then they try, they fall, they look at you surprised or maybe shortly crying or laughing and try again hundreds of times until the mm -hmm. day where they just walk and they never complain about it. They just do it and try it and try it and try it. And one day they achieve and this is what I want to give all the young ladies out there. Uh, try it and do it and learn from it. What should happen? You need to, to have a happy life and to do what you love. Thank you so much for this verse. I think they find a lot of agreement with it in the audience. Um, they're, like Catherine just commented, I think having children should uh, be looked at as the equivalent of an MBA. My skills increase tenfold because of being a mother. You probably can agree on that, I guess. <laughs> and yeah. management should be recruiting from the rank of mothers. Yeah, and Astrid, if, if I may so, add the, uh, to this conversation, yes, you know, since, since we landed on this topic of parenthood, and it's something that uh, I've been asked many times, right? So I'm not yet a parent myself, but work mm -hmm. with many mothers and, you know, being a newlywed as well, you know, going into marriages is, is uh, a totally different role that you play as a woman. And I think uh, what's important to note here, though, is that parenthood and whatever you do with your family, it's a two-person responsibility uh, and you know I'm I enjoy the fact that we as women talk about this because it's important the reality is still that we women um, even if you don't have children you're doing most of the housework or whatever that is required of you because that's your nature or perhaps part of it is societal expectations but um, it is as important I think one thing I shared uh, privately with Astrid and Petra when we did our speakers call is you know, one of the most important decisions that I personally think I, I have made um, and a woman has to make in her life is who is the partner for your life that you're going to choose. And as much as possible, you know, it should be 50-50. Women, uh, you know, for me, frankly, one of the biggest, when you ask this question about what is your biggest career achievement, it's interesting that everyone, Petra and Gabrielle said this word, I think it comes across very clearly that your career life is not linear, it is messy <laughs> and you need to accept that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, for me, one the, going back to sort of the decision that I made that I think put my life in a little bit of a mess is I found my husband um, and that was a non-negotiable for me because I wanted to find a man that would not be intimidated by my success which is very hard to find, by the way, for ambitious women, I think all of us will agree, who will want the best for you and for both of you as a family to play that 50-50 role. But what that meant was, you know, he's in America. I didn't exactly have a base here in the East Coast. And I built up my career and I was climbing it. I was doing well. I was thriving. And I think I was very proud of where I was heading. Um, but, you know, then I, I was at a crossroads and I decided, you know, thought it, I will... Um, marry this guy who proposed to me in under nine months and I had confidence in myself that for my career I will figure everything out but that man is irreplaceable and that was the decision I made and I had to hustle for the la last two years of figuring out and I think one of the biggest achievements is with literally I had no friends uh, I have no family other than my husband's family and as you know it's a different thing as well right? No support system. And I built that for myself. And I built a consortium of over 90 funds now that have pledged over a billion dollars and are actively deploying a billion dollars to its women founded companies to address a problem that I sincerely believe needs to be solved in our generation, right? Which is how capital into the hands of women and how do they own that and invest into technology that will shape our lives and the way we move forward. So um, hopefully, you know, that, that gives a little bit of perspective here into, 
you know, some of the things that you all are thinking for yourself, because again, you know, life is messy. Um, the moment I expected my life to be perfect is when I felt the most depressed and you need to let go of that. And I hope that you learn it faster than I do. <laughs> and I did. Thank you, Sarah. So we have about 20 minutes left. So let's like really dive now into the topic, how to make it into advisory boards. And um, we have a question that like um, got uh, also votes from the audience. So it was um, by Tan, where did it go? Oh, here. Um, how can future female leaders prepare past, best for getting in board positions? So what would be your like number one advice for young leaders and ambitious women to get into an advisory board position? Maybe I start um, from my point mm -hmm. of view, you need some basic knowledge about economic and, uh, and in a specific topic in the best case. And then it's really networking. If I think of my career, it was always specific persons that believed in me and supported me. And this is very important. And you have to be bold on the one hand and to, you have to be open for feedback as well and go for it. Uh, it's really, I think you, you need to be proactive, but before that, you have to work on the knowledge you need in order to do such a job. So it's not that it's you can learn everything from scratch. You can learn a lot from scratch, but I think some basic information uh, and knowledge uh, you need to look for yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, just a follow-up question from Susan, because I think it fits quite well. You mentioned the importance of network and her, her question was, how do I find trustful and sincere supporters slash peers at work? Because you mentioned you had people that always supported yeah. you. So. Uh, maybe you need to be open and you need to listen to your insight that nobody can tell you beforehand uh, how someone is but if you listen to yourself you have a feeling that this was always i can trust my gut's feeling and if mm -hmm. i have uh, the feeling i can trust this person um i had no experience in my life but you need to be very you know sensitive and then listen inside yourself okay is this the right person for you or not and uh with that i have very good experience Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's exactly like the female factor. We say like intuition, kind of a gut feeling. Yeah, that's really cool. So, um, so Petra, um, what would be your number one advice for like young women um, who want to get into an advisory board position? Yeah, yeah. Maybe I can add on what Gabriele said. Um, the thing is, I mean, being especially on a supervisory board mm -hmm. is not just fun. Yeah, it is um, like um, a high responsibility that you carry, and it is also a personal liability. That means, in case uh, you uh, do not act um, in a way as expected by a supervisory board member, um, you can be personally liable. And therefore, um, as Gabriele said, uh, it is very, very important that you prepare yourself. On the one hand, this is, um, I mean, learning about um, economical topics, but this is not the only thing. It is also about formal topics. Um, for me, it was like very helpful. And I, I got my confidence when I was like um, um, a CEO and I had a supervisory board to which I reported. So this is where I learned about all these um, formalities, about all these factors that are relevant and important um, within um, this field of supervisory boards. Being um, part of um, a very informal advisory board is something completely different. Like with market agent, it is they do not need to have by law such a such mm -hmm. a board. This is like more um, um, for their personal consulting and to have a thriving business. But um, if you are on a supervisory board, this is like obliged by law that companies have something like that, and then you have really, really your mm -hmm. responsibility. 
and um, also because normally um, there are many um, men sitting on these boards, you should be um, also very good prepared because um, otherwise you will not feel comfortable Yeah, because they are already there for longer. They have the experience how all that works. And um, if you do not show that you contribute something to that board, then you have a hard time. So I would really um, recommend... Uh, to find a kind of learning field, whatever that is. A good thing is, as I said, to report to such a board because then you know about um, how, how it works. Um, and the other thing is there are companies that are providing training yeah, for, for supervisory board members. Um, this is, I, I think this is something you have in every country, especially in Austria, I, I could name maybe one or two. Um, um, so, so this is one thing. And the other thing is there are companies that are searching board members. <laughs> um, we have something like that uh, in Austria too. However, as Gabriele said, uh, my experience was that I was never really, I mean, once, once I was suggested by, by such a company, um, but this was not to, to a supervisory board, but to an advisory board. Supervisory boards normally are uh, equipped with people from a certain kind of network, very often also politically oriented. And um, most of the time it is a completely male topic. And only if the company itself says like uh, deliberately, we would like to have a woman now in the board, then they start searching. And most of the time this is then a woman, somebody of the male network knows. Mm. So, I mean, this is just a reality. Yeah, it is a reality. And um, and therefore, um, networking, as also said by Gabriele, is really, really very important on the one hand. On the other hand, I'm not too sure whether you can really like steer that topic. Um, I was recommended by somebody where... I would have never expected that. I, and I did not search for a supervisory board membership myself, even, even though I thought, okay, I have the age, I have the experience, would be nice. But I myself, I had no idea how to make it to such a supervisory board. And then um, there was that company, um, Silhouette, and um, it was founded by a couple. And um, the woman uh, of that founder couple was the first woman on that supervisory board herself but she's now like 94 years old. And her daughter then said, okay, we should have after like um, 20 or 30 years without a woman on the board, we should now have a woman on the board. And this is how all that came. And then they started through their networks to search for somebody. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much for your honesty, like sharing that is really like, a lot about networking and knowing the right people and being at the right place at the right time. Maybe Sarah, you also have yeah. to add some, something on that. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you, Astrid, have. you know, it, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, it's important to take a little bit of a step back for all the women here today in terms of why get on a board and Gabrielle touched on this mm -hmm. and Petra touched on this a little bit, but it is to enhance your professional career. You know, once you get to an executive level, um, Sometimes you might feel as with many people in, let's say you're building your startup and you got it to a very successful level, you know, you would have been very focused in that niche uh, and you feel it's time to, you know, go into the next level and also learn something new and, and contribute to the extent that you can in a different environment. It is to play a bigger game, right? So, you know, the power of influence that you can have on boards is very important. And that's why we believe, you know, the principle of bringing more women in its, uh, not not to say that you know women are better than men and and i never you know go on stage saying this but it is but the fact that corporates today i believe the majority of corporates believe that you need to build a strong board which is built from diversity and diversity of opinion cuts across to make sure that it's not the same people in the network with group thing that will address the problem in the same way so it's important for us to step up to that responsibility because, you know, if you have that opportunity and you don't take it, uh, the reality is that the statistics, if you look at even just corporate boards today, the reality is to get to that 30 percent. Some of you may know the 30 percent club is if we're going at the rate that we are today, it'll, it'll be more than a generation before we actually even hit that target. So whilst I don't necessarily like quotas, you know, I think more 
no one here wakes up and wants to be that token woman because of a quota. Mm. But in many cases, it is necessary. So I feel very conflicted on this, but I know it's necessary. And in places like France, Germany, it has worked to a certain extent, right? There's a lot more to be desired, but um, it is something that we need to work towards and, and, you know, step up to that game. And beyond that, you know, it's a lot of uh, building your own network. It's also a way to open up opportunities for yourself and learn something beyond what you've been doing for the last uh, decade of, of your career. So I think it's important. But beyond that, once you get into that role, you need to sort of understand, as Petra said, right, first of all, I think it's important. We didn't really make the distinction here. But an advisor, a supervisory board member, a corporate board member for a public listed company and a startup board member, a nonprofit board member, they're all very different things and they're very different connotations. But for those board members by law, as Petra had mentioned in the role that she's playing, it is a fiduciary responsibility, right? So you own a, a position where if you don't act in line with governance and you're negligible on certain issues that you should know about, you know, that is a personal liability and it is a reputational risk. So you need to think about what this means for you as you step into that position. A lot of the women that I know on boards do a damn good job because that's just the way that they're wired. They do their homework, they show up on time and, you know, they, they really, really deliver. And it's important to remember as well in, especially I, I believe in Germany it might be the case where the terms may be longer, right? It can be uh, annual renewal, but for, I know in, in London, it's uh, UK, it's nine years. So for a corporate board seat, a public listed company, uh, nine years is a long time. So it is a commitment, right? If you're going to do all this hard work, you want to believe in this company and you want to be sort of making that mark for you. Uh, so how to prepare, you know, I think networking is important, as everyone here has said, being strategic about it. If you're going for a, especially when you're young and I'm in that position where, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of doing more startup and venture. So that's definitely through the networks that you built. But if you're looking to go into public listed companies and things like that, you know, the Egon Zenders of the world, those search companies you were mentioning, Petra, um, those are the people you want to know about because, uh, I think in Europe, there is actually more demand than in the United States. It's actually a little bit of a harder slog here uh, where the openings for directorships are in the hundreds, right? You think about US and the companies, it's hundreds. Whereas in Europe, because of quotas, there's thousands of um, vacancies which companies are looking for. You want to be hearing about that. So building those intentional mm -hmm. networks and... Uh, Whilst Petra, you know, I think she's being modest about, oh, I never expected, but she put herself in that position to know this person. And because obviously she's done a good job and impressed this person, um, he recommended her, right? So being intentional about even where you are to be at the right place and right time, I think is important. And as Gabrielle said, building your niche, I think uh, beyond, for me, my personal opinion, it's you need to have basic knowledge across the macro, but if you're choosing, say, finance or you want to be on a board of a finance company, you better be an expert in a certain space, right? If you And think about which committee you want to sit on. If you want to sit on the audit committee, you know, you better be qualified and bring the right things to the table. So it's, it's a whole mix of uh, preparation, networking, and, you know, being intentional about it. To add just one thing, which wasn't I wasn't so much aware about it uh, before I started these positions, is uh, besides being reliable, you sometimes also have to make hard decisions. And this also means something for you personal, emotionally. And this was sometimes for me quite hard to, that I knew from a rational point of view, it is necessary, but from an emotional point of view, it was very hard to stick to the decision. Uh, and you also have to deal with these kind of situations. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's so interesting. Um, so we have about like eight, -ish, eight minutes left. And this would be the chance now for one of our live participants to request um, to like access via mic and camera to like really ask you guys a question live. So... 
you should have see the option here and then I can admit you to the stage. I don't know if you're like, somebody's keen on doing that. <laughs> um, so that would be now the time. Your chance to uh, ask those three ladies about really their experience when you have some burning questions. Um, but of course, we have still other questions prepared. Um, so again, we're, we're talking about like network and especially Sarah mentioned it being like attentional about building your network, being strategic about it. So you maybe, maybe because you all mentioned that it's kind of important. So maybe you can give a couple, like really one or two tips how to be attentional and strategic about networking. What did work for you? Uh, maybe before I answer the question, one thing that is for me also important is that people who are thinking to take over such a position really need to have a, an intrinsic motivation to push change and shape the future. Uh, I think it's not for persons who just uh, love to do uh, administrative or more to have a clear uh, guidance from someone. So I think it's really for people who really have an intrinsic motivation to change future. And concerning uh, networking, um, if you are interested in networking, there are far too much possibilities uh, to network. So I think you have very much to prioritize and to see which event is now really fits to what you're looking for. And um, also with social media, you can be networked with thousands, but you have to also do something. It's uh, with the contacts. It's not just to, to um, connect with them and then not talk anymore with them. So I personally, if I think of my career, <laughs> I recognize now that often I was the one who was looking for a specific person because I knew this person is doing something interesting and I went to this person and talked to them. Otherwise, mm -hmm. maybe I would have never met them. But it was because I was really interested in the person and there was... Um, beforehand I checked really who are the persons I'm interested in and then I tried to find events locations opportunities in order to get in direct touch with them and I really recommend that thank you um, we have one question here in the chat um, do you think that in today's world it's realistic to become a director of a company you never met physically before um, Maybe Sarah or Petra. Yeah. Do, what's so your I can opinion take on that? that actually, um, Dina. Is, yeah. Thank, thanks for that question, and it's a good one because actually, you know, a lot of the, you know, I work in investments, right? And um, given the outbreak of COVID, which is very unfortunate, what it's forced a lot of the VCs to do. Uh, a lot of us investors, we are forced to look at deals, right? Because if you think about the business of what we are in in venture capital, is we're money managers and we need to get the best deal for financial returns. And if we're not making investments, you know, it's, it's again, another responsibility where we're pressured by our investors that, that right? So uh, there are deals being done completely virtual. Uh, I can report there are, you know, in the last two weeks, there were uh, two of our partner funds had done literally like million dollar deals uh, in the US. And this is going to become the norm because business needs to continue, unfortunately, uh, despite the circumstances. So what happens is then that, um, you know, if I'm an investor, part of it is I'm going to negotiate for a board seat, depending on, of course, you know, the percentage of equity, what I'm negotiating for. But a lot of the VCs that are active investors want to have a board seat and by that nature in return of giving away part of your equity, it's also as a startup, you know, you're going to give a, a director position. So it is feasible. Um, this is exactly what you're thinking of, Dina. So yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it is happening and it's continuing to happen. And uh, this is a separate flip. But you know, if you're a startup, I'm not sure what your background is. But if you're a startup, you know, uh, something to think about is how do you evaluate your directors, right? I mentioned early on, even 
even in a startup, getting an investment and getting a new director onto your board is like a marriage because it's long term. So you want to think about if this helps you think about your role as a director, right? You want to evaluate your director. Is this person actually opening the doors and contributing to my business? Right. And that's uh, sort of it goes both ways. So uh, think about that. And hopefully that's helpful. But good news is it's happening for corporate boards. I think it's going to be a little bit of a slog. Um, frankly, it is still very traditional, but especially in the younger groups, you know, those of you who are in startups and things like that um, and feel like, oh, you know, the, the good news is experience is not a um, not too much of a limiter these days in the startup world because you have the 20 year olds who are creating billion dollar companies, right? So there's a little bit of a shift compared to corporate boards. Uh, so I hate using the seniority card, but it is still the hard reality that we're up against mm -hmm. that if we don't have the experience, uh, you know, I can't compare to Petra who has, you know, a lot more experience than I do in being evaluated, for example. But what you want to do is you want to be friends with Petra, right? So that when you're up mm -hmm. for it, uh, Petra can recommend you. And that's, I think, the strategy we all need to have here in Female Factor to recommend each other and build the next generations of leadership. And that's how we gain control <laughs> and change the landscape. So thank yeah, you so absolutely. much. Absolutely. And again, this is an excellent point. Um, like, as I have, you probably know that all of the three amazing women here are mentors at the female factors so <laughs> if you want to get to know them better um, and have get in touch with them you can uh, be um, become a member at the female factor and apply so yeah we have like two minutes left so maybe one very short closing statement from petra and then i'm like going to wrap up the session and tell you what's next on the agenda of our conference so Petra, yeah, maybe something like that. Um, yeah, is still like on my mind is networking. Mm -hmm. Yes, however, as said before, it is not like networking on events. Uh, it is really about doing a good job and then somebody recognizing that. Um, looking for um, a position as a managing director or a CEO where you have a board that you report to. Because then these people get to know you and then they value your work. And this was like my way. Mm -hmm. um, and one last sentence. Uh, I believe in the topic of trust. Um, and especially uh, if you join a more traditional company, as also said by Sarah before, uh, it is a lot about trust. And this is something that um, builds better in a physical world. I had to visit um, the company. I'm now um, part of the supervisory board like two times for an entire day. I went through the entire company. They showed me the production and all. And after that, they decided. Uh, so um, building trust is something um, which is crucial and also something you should look for um, when you do your networking. So very selected, but then go deep. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, um, we ran out of time. I mean, we could have chatted way longer. It was so interesting from my side. A huge, huge thank you. Um, just also like here in the chat, let the ladies know how you liked it. Tanya already wrote, thank you for your ex experience. Super interesting and helpful insights. And um, just we will now have a 10 minute break and be back with the sessions at uh, 5.20 and just use this time for like a little stretch or check out the networking area and interact with some people here at the conference. So see you soon. It was really a pleasure. Thank you so much again.